Welcome to Scripture Snippets, where we're going to begin our study in the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation. We're going to be going over a general overview of the book, and then we're going to begin chapter 1 in the study. So go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation. Uh, we won't begin reading until uh, chapter 1. We'll try to take it uh, verses through verses, and then I will uh, be giving a general overview. So let's talk about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the message from Jesus Christ to his church in which he outlines the climax of human history. This is going to be our climactic point. The book begins with the glorious appearance of Jesus Christ to John, uh, the apostle, in which Christ commissions John to write down what he has seen and the things that were about to be revealed to him. Uh, John is going to see a series of things, not just the future, uh, but he also talks about the present as Christ addresses uh, the seven churches. The visions in the book were revealed to John while he was imprisoned uh, for the testimony of Jesus, like we'll see in chapter 1, on the island of Patmos uh, during the reign of Domitian, uh, which he ruled for between AD 81 and AD 96. Uh, Generally, uh, there is an accepted date of writing uh, for the book of Revelation in AD 95. Uh, most biblical scholars hold uh, to that. Uh, there are some, uh, I believe there's an erroneous teaching out there that tries to date the book at a much, much earlier date, uh, but there's no proof on it, and it really doesn't make sense uh, since we have a definitive scripture. Uh, from John saying that he was on the Isle of Patmos, uh, and we have uh, very accurate records that it was Domitian that was the one that sentenced the Apostle John uh, to the exile in the Isle of Patmos. So it doesn't make sense. Um, it only makes sense for people who try to hold to what's called a preterist view, um, but again, they're twisting. They're actually tw they actually are twisting scripture uh, to fit to to fit their viewpoint uh, because it's very specific in Revelation chapter one that he was on the Isle of Patmos. And like I said, if we do our historical duty, we understand that John was uh, condemned there during the reign of Domitian, uh, and Domitian only ruled between AD eighty one and ninety six. So perhaps. Uh, the most popular church leader of his day, John was the only one of the twelve apostles still alive at this time um, that he wrote this book. Uh, the book of Revelation was immediately and universally accepted as the last of the inspired writings. It has been through pretty much all of church history. Neither its authorship by John uh, nor the late date of its writing, 8095, has ever been seriously questioned by those who interpret the Bible literally. Uh, again, I, I already hit that point up uh, on that if you interpret it literally. It wasn't until the 3rd century that the suggestion was even launched that another John may have written it, and, and such a notion has no credibility in history, and it's been long rejected by church leaders and church fathers. Christ gave his vision to John and to all believers to comfort them in their trials. This book is not a book to scare us, but again to comfort us. He assures them that there will be a day of rest for those who love God, that he will meet them in the air, and that while the church is with him in heaven, the terrible tribulation in which he spoke will occur on the earth. Um, again, we can go back to Mark chapter 13 and see where Christ talked about this instance. The importance of the tribulation period is confirmed in the fact that 12 chapters of the book are devoted to describing over 50 details about it. So just in a small section of Scripture, there's over 50 details. So that should alert us as believers that we need to take this seriously. We need to look at it. And it's giving a message of hope, but it's also giving a message of urgency that we need to share the gospel. When we combine this text with the many Old Testament patch, passages that mention the tribulation, like what we find in uh, such books as Ezekiel, what we find in such books as Daniel, more prof uh, and, and that more prophecy is actually devoted to that brief period of time than any other comparable period in history. We see that a large bulk of scripture has to deal with this seven year period that we call the great uh, the tribulation and the great tribulation. However, a grim portrayal of the future days of the tribulation again is not 
all that Revelation contains. Uh, for instance, we, we read about the glorious rapture of the church in ch- chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and we'll go over that. Uh, the church is mentioned 19 times in chapters 1 through 3, uh, especially as we have those letters to the churches. But in the 12 churches that describe the tribulation period, it's not mentioned once. And that is why I hold to a rapture, uh, a rapture theology, uh, because nowhere in this tribulation period uh, do we see it. And again, it fits. Uh, if you go back to my uh, the podcast on the rapture, uh, you'll go into why I believe in it a lot more. But if you take a Bible in the literal sense and you read it in the full context, a pre-tribulational rapture uh, fits fits scripture, uh, fits perfectly. Uh, again, we, we, we get we read about it in First Thessalonians chapter four in its detail. Uh, we we've we've had examples of it throughout scripture where raptures have happened before. And it also makes sense uh, taking in First Thessalonians chapter five, where it says that we're not appointed unto wrath, and we are the bride of Christ. And you start looking at those things, and then again, when you look at the book of Revelation as a whole, here we are. We're mentioned um, all the way through, and again, chapter four, verses one and two, and then after that, the church isn't mentioned again uh, for for a long period of time. For again, the, those next twelve chapters, at least. Uh, so that omission can easily be explained when you understand that the church has taken the heaven prior to the beginning of the tribulation. Um, so again, if you go back on my study uh, of the rapture, you'll understand uh, that even more. So following the tribulation, Christ and his saints will return to earth to rule for a thousand years. So we, we're raptured up into heaven. Uh, the events, uh, God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, but other people are saved. Uh, during And then after a time at the Battle of Armageddon, Christ comes back and he comes back with his bride. Uh, it says he comes back with the saints that come with him and then will uh, rule with Christ during the millennial reign uh, and rule rule for a thousand years. But it will be followed by a day when evil will be vanquished forever, and Satan and his minions and all who have spurned the Lord Jesus Christ will be cast into eternal hell, into the lake of fire. So Revelation 119 actually provides for us a very good outline of the entire book. Uh, So I'd like for you to look at that. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 19 uh, says the following. Let me go ahead and get there. Turn to it. I should have had it already. pulled up here, but it it says here, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So we have a clear three-point outline. Uh, Number one, the things which you have seen. Uh, This is the introduction and the description that we'll read of the resurrected Christ. That's what we'll get in chapter one. Uh, The things which are, that will be chapters 2 and 3. Um, that's going to be the outline of church history. So we get the seven letters of churches, which again can actually be qualified in our uh, first one or uh, for bullet two because they existed uh, during John's time. The seven churches were actual literal seven churches, and they had these seven literal problems. Uh, but most biblical scholars agree that each one of the churches represent a certain age in church history, and we see certain characteristics in the overall church age. And we'll go over that when we go over uh, the letters to the churches in chapters two and three. And then, of course, bullet three, the things which will take place after this. Uh, So in chapter four, uh, again, I mentioned verse one and two, the rapture of the church. And then we get a scene in heaven where Christ kind of lays it all out about what's about to take place. It's it's kind of the uh, the 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 nail biting scene of who's worthy to open the scrolls. Uh, and then uh, the second section B, I guess you can say in our outline, is is the actual seven-year tribulation where we have the seal judgments, the trumpet, and the bowl judgments. Uh, you'll see the short reign of the Antichrist and destruction of, quote-unquote, Babylon. Uh, point C, we have the glorious appearing of Christ in chapter 19. Again, this will take place after the, our third bullet point again. Uh, you'll see the binding of Satan and the millennial kingdom of Christ and the final judgment. Um, and then, of course, the eternal order uh, called heaven uh, with the new Jerusalem. 
So the book of Revelation relates the events of John's visions through the use of symbols, many of which are unique to the book and some of which are not explained. Uh, you have to understand that John, who is living again in the 80, he's writing this book in the 8090s, um, he's seeing things in the future. He's seeing things like atomic weaponry. He's seeing things like modern technology. He didn't have the words that we have today. He didn't know how to describe. Uh, you know, he didn't know the word television. He didn't know uh, the. He didn't even know the word atomic. Those words did not exist in that modern language, even though it was a a very advanced language. Because he wrote in the Koine Greek, uh, there was still uh, not enough. So he had to use descriptive senses and descriptive symbols. So when we talk about certain things. Again, I'll go over on what they could symbolize um, when we hear about things like uh, a third of the fish uh, being destroyed, uh, things of a third of the earth being consumed by fire. You know, a lot of that things hint to modern things that we know of today, um, whether it could have been uh, a, a atomic war, um, you know, that that, that it's just as, as catastrophic and it could cause great environmental hazards. And we see uh, things that are suffered there. And so John's seen these things, and he uses symbols on his in his best way uh, to relay these things to us. Uh, so the key to understanding the book and the visions is to understand what is literal and what is symbolic, and to realize that even the symbols. So even when we talk about things like the trumpets, the bowls, the beast, uh, rep they represent even though they're symbols, they represent real events and real people. Again, he was using symbolic language. Uh, to get across what he was literally seeing. So they, they, they are real events and real people. They're not to be seen as a metaphor. Uh, they're, they're just symbols used to describe an actual real thing. Uh, so those who do not interpret the book literally will fail to understand its real meaning, and the blessing of the realities it portrays uh, will be diminished. Uh, Revelation also unveils the return of Christ in power to this earth to set up his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, followed by the final judgment of all lost souls just before he takes believers into God's eternal heaven. A more beautiful description of life after death for eternity cannot be found in all of literature. The book of Revelation concludes all the prophecies of the Hebrew prophets, concludes everything, all the writings of the apostles, and it concludes all the teachings of Jesus Christ. Just as Genesis revealed to us the beginning of the battle of the ages between God and Satan for the souls of men, Revelation concludes it. And it concludes it uh, with the return of Jesus Christ to this earth, and he returns in power and glory uh, as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Everyone recognizes him, every knee bows, every tongue confesses. And a special blessing is promised to the reader of Revelation. We need to, to understand that we need uh, to read this book. Uh, too many pastors and too many church uh, leaders today are too afraid to study this book uh, because they're intimidated by the symbolic, because they don't want to take it in a literal sense, I think, because it, it does bring, a, a, it, it, and it should, again, it shouldn't scare us, uh, but it should motivate us. It, it should urge us. It, it's a call to action. And really, it's a fitting book to close uh, Scripture off with because that's what we need. It's like, now you know. Now you know these things, so get out there and do what you're supposed to do. And that's to spread the good news of the salvation uh, through Jesus Christ and Him alone and through faith alone. Uh, but a special blessing is actually given to us uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed is he who reads... And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So we actually have a promise. Um, Revelation contains more unfulfilled prophecy than any other book in the Bible. Uh, something prophetic can be found in every one of its 22 chapters. Of 404 verses, 383 are prophetic, amounting to 95% of the book. So this is definitely a prophetic book. So let's get into it. Uh, let's go ahead and start uh, reading in Revelation uh, chapter 1. Again, this is uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is one that reveals this. Even though John pins it down, we have to understand that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, which most, the majority of all Bibles, uh, start off with that. Um, that's the official title uh, they give to it, is uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, 
as given to uh, John the Apostle. Uh, the the word revelation in the Greek is actually apocalypsis, uh, which is where we get our word apocalypse. Um, and it actually means to reveal or unveil that which is hidden. Uh, so just so we're going to be seeing some uh, uh, some unveilings, uh, the unveilings of the first time. So let's go ahead again in verse one, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. So God, the father uh, gave Jesus Christ uh the rest of the plan he's saying he's saying you, you know that and of course christ was all knowing because he was god as well uh but this is kind of like the time the time where it says okay now is the time let's lay this whole thing out and he sent signified it by his angel to his servant john who bore witness to the word of god and to the testimony of jesus christ to all things that he saw and again we get this promise in verse three blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near uh, and then john is going to greet uh, the seven churches that he uh here in the book of revelation um because he receives a specific message from Jesus Christ himself that he will reveal to these seven churches in chapter 2 and 3. Uh, so we know that these seven churches actually received uh, the full uh, book of Revelation. And again, they were prominent churches in the early church. Uh, so we, we know that definitely this book got out and it was considered an accepted form of Scripture. And John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Uh, these seven churches actually exist in what we consider modern day Turkey, but again was Asia Minor, uh, located out throughout there. Um, I will include a, a map and chart on our Facebook page if you would like to see that. Uh, so, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Okay, again, we see here he's recognizing Christ as being eternal. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Again, recognizing uh, the salvation message of Jesus Christ. So again, we're getting uh, something here. We're, we're being reminded of the beauty of Christ. Verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Just as we open prayer and admonition to God, John opens an admonition unto God. Verse 7, behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Amen. Again, here in verse 7, um, this guarantee that Jesus is coming again, literally and physically, uh, it, it goes along with the 328 other promises of his coming again. Um, the second coming of Jesus is mentioned more frequently than any other subject except salvation itself. It was mentioned by the prophets, the apostles, the angels, and even Jesus himself in John chapter 14 and Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Jesus will return, and all who have received him by faith will join him. Those who reject him will also see him, but they're going to mourn, and they're going to wail at his coming. Uh, so we have to understand that uh, this is going to be for everybody. Uh, Jesus' second return, again, this, we're not talking about the rapture here, but we're talking about his glorious appearing, his, 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 his physical coming back to the earth, where he physically comes back and his physical advent back to the earth. Um, he's going to be seen by all. And uh, you're going to be in one of two camps. You're going to be those that rather uh, are ecstatic and and rejoice, or you're going to be in the camp that is wailing and woeing because uh, you realize uh, you have rejected the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, again, and, and we get the fulfillment uh, from Acts, from the Book of Acts. Uh, where the angels declared, uh, "Do you see this the, the same Jesus? He will he will return to you again in the same way." So he's coming in the clouds, and then verse eight, Jesus says, "I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Again, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the end. So it's showing the completeness, the beginning and the end. Again, the book of Colossians tells us that even Jesus Christ uh, was the one that created uh, the heavens and the earth. He was the one there speaking and doing that. He's he's there in the beginning. He's there in the end. He's fully God. Uh, Jesus Christ, again, this speaks of his deity. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So, and then verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, Patmos, again, was a small island um, off the uh, Greek coast, uh, kind of near... Uh, uh, it was near to uh, the Turkey border, but it was actually pretty much right out there in the middle. Um, there near the Aegean Sea, uh, it was in the Mediterranean Sea, but it was there right along the border between uh, the Mediterranean and the Aegean Sea. Um, but it, it, it was, it was pretty much right there smack in the middle, uh, a good distance off from Rhodes. But I guess if, 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 if you know of uh, any of Greek history, I guess that would be uh, the best way for me uh, to describe it. Um, again, right there, kind of right there again on the border. If you, t if you take a, a, a world globe or a map section of that, you'll see it there. Um, it's a big island that was located Again, it pretty much right there. It pretty much was right there on the split between the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And he was exiled here uh, because of his faithfulness. Um, all right. First, uh, chapter 10, verse 10. I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Uh, spirit on the Lord's day pretty much uh, is a reference to Sunday uh, again on there. Um, and this is actually the first use of, uh, of the term the Lord's Day in the New Testament. Um, by this time, Christians were accustomed uh, to meeting to read Scripture, teach, and pray on the first day of the week, which they called the Lord's Day. Uh, this was their testimony that their Lord r rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Um, that's why they called it the Lord's Day. That's why they decided to meet there. Um, there's been uh, some confusion uh, because uh, we have a tendency to call it uh, the Sabbath day. Um, many do, um, but it, it, it's actually been just a movement of it. Uh, but technically, the Lord's Day was the first day of the week, which is Sunday, um, and that recognizes, again, Christ's um, Christ's resurrection because he rose again on the first day of the week on, on a Sunday. Um I don't want to go into the whole uh, Sabbath uh, teaching. Um, we'll, we'll leave that for another podcast. But it's absolutely okay uh, for Sunday to be your Sabbath. It's okay for any day of the week uh, to be your Sabbath, uh, just as long as you do one in seven. Uh, and, it, and it's to take care of yourself. People don't realize that God gave us that rule um, to keep it holy so we can have a day devoted to Him and to concentrate on Him. But He also did it for our good sake. Um, doctors have found out that, that we need to do that. So again, I don't want to get caught up in that because we're uh, teaching this right now. So he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Of course, this voice is Jesus Christ saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Again, seven actual physical churches that existed during the early church days. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Okay? Each one of these lampstands represents one of the seven churches. I just want you all to understand that right now. Again, what did Jesus Christ tell us that we are as the church? He, he said that we are the light to the world. He, he made us a light to the world. He said we shouldn't put our light under a bushel. So uh, a lamp stand is where this lamp comes from. Again, the physical churches, the, the churches representing where this light is coming from. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, clothed with a garment down to the feet 
and girded about the chest with a golden band. Um, high priests wore long robes as they ministered in the holy place in the temple, and this represents Jesus Christ being our high priest. Uh, this this attire that he's having on, this garment down to his feet, and then being girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Uh, again, let's go back to a little bit to that chest with a golden band. It refers to uh, uh, th- that golden band actually was a symbol of strength and authority uh, back in the early days. Um, so we, ha- we, we have a symbol of that. And his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. Again, that conveys uh, the thought uh, of antiquity, of, of wisdom, of, of purity. Um, it reminds us... Um, of Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter seven, where Christ is called the ancient of days. Um, it speaks of the righteousness of God. It speaks of the purity and the sin, uh, sinlessness of God because his head and hair were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. Um, whenever you break that verse down in the Greek where it says his eyes were like a flame of fire, uh, it literally means his eyes shot fire. Um, and what that it means is that indicates that Christ was indignant over the indifference, in some cases, of the apostate churches. He was angry, um, he, but he was serious. He's a merciful God, and we'll see that. We'll see that in the letters, but he was serious here. Um, and whenever the Church of Jesus Christ is not what it should be, uh, we need to understand that it arouses indignation in Jesus Christ. He's not happy about that. I think too many churches today are, are too calloused and too focused on the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ that they don't understand that he holds the churches accountable. Uh, We are held accountable as believers. And Jesus Christ um, looks at our actions. He sees how we treat. He sees if we're outreaching to our communities. He sees if we're loving our neighbors. He sees that if we're actually spreading the good news or if we're just glorified social clubs. And the church today has become nothing but a glorified social club, it looks like. It looks like we want, we would rather peace to the hearts of men, uh, provide activities, rather than preaching the soon return of Jesus Christ and, and getting people saved, getting people to, to, to rejoice in the Son and to worship Him. And why and what does that do to Christ? It makes His eyes like a flame of fire when He looks upon us, full of indignation and anger towards His church. And it's something that we should take seriously. His feet were like a fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. Uh, the bronze imagery speaks to us of judgment, um, it re- because it points back to the brazen altar at the tabernacle. What happened at that brazen altar? Do you remember what happened? If if you if you're a student uh, a student of scripture, what happened at that brazen tabernacle? That's where sin was judged. So so so. His feet, as brass, if it were refined in a furnace, represents the firm, the firm judgment of Jesus Christ. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Um, if you've ever been uh, to Niagara Falls or at the edge of a waterfall, or even if you've been uh, t- even down to a creek, you know, I'm a little country boy here in Kentucky. When it floods, when we get serious rains and you go down to the creek and you hear that rushing, it can drown you out. If you're in certain sections, you have to uh, elevate your voice to be heard because the sound of rushing water can, can be deafening. And um, that's the power uh, that he has in his voice. He had in his right hand seven stars. Um, we're going to get an interpretation of this in, in verse 20, uh, but I'll go ahead and let you know the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Um, that Greek word translated angels is literally messengers. Um, some people believe that the word angel here refers to pastors uh, appointed by God to lead the local congregations, uh, which I, I kind of hold closer to. Uh, that angelos um, in the Greek, again, is translated um, messenger. And uh, I believe he was talking about the pastors there. Uh, and it kind of gives us a very uh, serious attitude if you're going to be a pastor in a church um, to talk about the accountability uh, that we have uh, when we place ourselves in that office. Uh, but another view is that each messenger is an actual angel. 
uh, a, a seraphim, a cherubim, angel, uh, probably more uh, a cherubim, because um, they were the messengers of God, um, an actual mess- uh, angel assigned to that church. Uh, so this could mean that all churches have guardian angels, uh, just as Christ indicated that little children have guardian angels back in Matthew 18. Um, so either view, I think, is accurate, and, and honestly, I think it's both. I think I think it's both. I think he's addressing uh, the pastors here um, by making sure they understand the messengers, but he, he's also giving us an affirmation that uh, the churches are overseen by a uh, guardian angel. So he had in his right hand seven stars. Again, those are the the churches, the angels of the church, the messengers. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, the word of God. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength, the majesty. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. Again, he felt, uh, this is going to be our natural uh, response when we see the majesty of God. Um, we cannot look upon his face. And again, that's, that's what happened here. Um, it, John couldn't even look at his face. Uh, he fell like he was dead. Uh, again, when we read... In Isaiah, Isaiah had a similar experience uh, that that he, he fell as dead before the Lord. Uh, Ezekiel, the same. Uh, we, we see this consistently. Moses was not even allowed uh, to look upon uh, he, to look upon his face. Uh, he had to, he had to take off even his shoes for he was going to be upon holy ground. So the holiness of God is a very important thing, something uh, that's lacking today. But we see that here. And John fell as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. Ain't that awesome? We get that from Christ. So much, that phrase, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. He lives. He was dead, and he lives, and behold, he's alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Christ controls all. Verse 19, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Again, uh, as I mentioned, this is our outline, so we're going to talk about the things that he's seen, uh, the things which are, and then the things which will uh, happen in the future. Uh, The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. And again, Jesus Christ is interpreting us for us. Again, make sure you use Scripture to interpret Scripture a lot. That's how I knew uh, what the seven stars were and what the seven golden lampstands were, because in my studies, again, I've read the whole. I didn't, just didn't read a, uh, a, a certain portion of Scripture and then take it out of context. I made sure I read the whole, and that's what we get here. Again, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. So let's close there in chapter 1, and we'll talk about these seven churches uh, coming up in chapter 2 and chapter 3, and we'll go over them a little bit more. Uh, Again, they were seven literal churches during this time, but they're messages that we need to hold to today. We see attributes uh, of of some of the failures and some of the successes in churches even today. Um, But again, it it can also be used as a timeline uh, through church history, as we have now been uh, able to see through time, uh, through the corridor of time, we've been able to see how the church has played out and how it lines up with these seven letters as well. Uh, They're not there to be confusing. Uh, They're there to be encouraging. Uh, They're there to challenge us, uh, especially uh, what I consider with the letter to the Church of Ephesus. That one has always spoke to me uh, as much as even the letter to Laodicea. 
that one's very harsh as well. And very much the reality of what we live in today, a Laodicean church age. But we're going to talk about the seven churches. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and challenge you, if you will. Go ahead and read ahead. Read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, read those seven. Uh, read about those seven churches, and we'll talk about that uh, in the next, uh, on the next uh, episode of Scripture Snippets. Thank you. God bless.